So there's no question that we're heading for some kind of financial reset. There will be some kind of universal reset happening, but different countries responding in their own different ways. I think the very, very universal outcome will be digital currency of some form. Please join us for our next live stream Sunday, October 30th at 9 p.m. Eastern. We'll go over current events, past guests, and of course, gold and silver news. Once again, our next live stream will be Sunday, October 30th, 9 p.m. Eastern. See you then. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Silver Bullion Television, SBTV. I'm your host, Patrick Vieira. Warren Black from the Global Wealth Club joins us today. Warren is a former qualified lawyer, accountant, and financial planner, and he combines all of his 25-plus years of experience to help individuals with creative strategies to protect their wealth and become sovereign. We're delighted to have Warren join us once again today. It's time to settle up and silver up for Warren Black. Warren, welcome back to SBTV. How are you doing? Oh, I'm great, Patrick. How's things your end? Hanging in there. I'm hanging in there just like everyone else. And Warren, we last spoke about four months ago and we discussed how the Great Reset is coming and we need to take radical action to protect ourselves. Warren, have things gotten any better since four months ago, economically, financially, fiscally, geopolitically? Anything? Has anything gotten any better? Look, honestly, I think it's all a matter of time, Patrick. It's a ticking time bomb. I mean, everyone from Robert Kiyosaki and Second Chance to... Um, Harry Dent to um, various economists, Jim Rickards, Porter Staines, we almost, every, you, um, Silver Bullion, myself, everyone I know who has any knowledge of economics is like the current system can't be sustained. You know, when every 45 years or every 90 years almost about fail, when you've got a very debt based, very, you know, credit based system, eventually you start to hit these kind of problems. And so there's no question that we're heading for some kind of financial reset. The Great Reset to me is just some kind of marketing label, but there's no question that there's going to have to be some massive solution that's going to come out of it. And, you know, generally governments try and solve problems that is printing more money and diluting the value of the money supply. And anyone who's got any real wealth knows that that's not real wealth. I know it's all fictitious and hence why we've teamed up with you of Silver Bullion to actually get real gold, real, real silver. So no, if anything, I think it's it's accelerating faster. It's just that most people just don't see how quickly it's happening. And yeah, no, I think since I last spoke to you, I'm, I think it's definitely closer. And I'm, I've noticed that all the most successful people are always a bit paranoid and they're always taking preventative measures others aren't taking. So for me, yeah, absolutely, we're heading that way. And if, if people haven't been taking action up to this day, it's getting pretty hard. You know, steadily but surely, bond yields, they are continuing to invert. As such, we saw the UK pivot in order to sort of save the pensions tied to the bond market with the Bank of England buying, buying government bonds. Will we see more and more and more central bank interventions as they try to keep the wheels from coming off? Oh, no doubt, because... You've got a situation where governments and banks know that if the whole thing completely unwinds and turns into violence and civil unrest and chaos, politicians don't like that, even though they don't necessarily care about their people. You know, some do, some don't. The biggest thing is that they're going to be voted out. So generally, when things are going fairly well, governments tend to get rewarded in the elections, whereas when things completely turn downhill, they tend not to be. And it's a fairly major crisis. So I think governments, um, the best thing you could do is, is slowly wind things down and stop basically printing money and start limiting expenses and cutting expenses down. Now, we've done that over where we live in West Australia. And our government's got some criticism, but to their credit, they've actually cut a lot of expenses. Um, and even I, I heard the most extraordinary statement from our prime minister about three weeks ago, which my mouth dropped because Labor are well known for being more socialist. He actually said, when asked why he wasn't continuing pandemic payouts, he said, we've got to teach our people to stop relying on government handouts and bit by bit to learn some financial responsibility. Now, I'm paraphrasing him, but it's basically what he said. And I just, my mouth just dropped open. I thought, never thought I'd hear the day that comes from a politician's mouth. And it was a, a good statement. But in saying that, I think the majority, all it's going to do is mitigate things a little bit. Governments, by and large, just printing money is what's 
the elect what people scream for like look at america right now america just keeps printing money um look at england look at everywhere right now they just keep printing money um recently liz trust the new british prime minister who just has no idea what she's doing from what i can see she to her credit she tried to cut taxes to stimulate things a little bit and she's been stopped by her party who if anything wants to increase taxes and you just got a world right now with a new woke world a new different world people just are not willing to pay the kind of high taxes anymore they used to pay you know they're just not willing to do it people want to pay minimal taxes they see that the the corporations pay less there's just a lot of change happening right now and i think governments are going to be frantically bailing out until eventually it's just going to unwind i i really all you can really hope is that this is it is mitigated that's that's my honest opinion yeah, you know, with these uh, central banks and governments, the, the central banks, they, they will forever say they are independent from governments. But, you know, Warren, do you see governments and central banks already at this point or maybe even prior where they more or less are one and the same? Pretty much, yeah. I mean, they are technically independent, so to speak, because the central banks are private and the governments are not private. But, yeah, look, to some degree they are separate, but... Reality is a bit like in theory, the court system is separate from the political system, whereas in the real world, that doesn't really happen so much anymore. And without diverting from the topic of this meeting, I've firsthand experienced this when I used to be a lawyer, seeing how blatantly the government and the courts pretty much just did what each other wanted to do. So, yeah, look, I think that they're, they're working together to a degree. The banks will keep doing what they're doing or whatever else. They'll keep frantically trying to buy it back because governments will be pushing i think a classic example of, of what governments are doing right now acting reactively not proactively is what happened with the vaccine i mean you've got the private head of astrazeneca um Ruth rudd dobber on the 30th of july 2020 in a speech on reuters openly saying when asked why have you insisted on indemnity for your vaccine when you believe in it he said look he said it's a provisionally approved vaccine. We don't know the, the actual results until 2024. What side effects? That's how a trial vaccine works. It takes five years to actually know the full results. He said, we're not going to become financially responsible because governments in their reactivity want to push this forward. Now, the most honest speech you'll ever get. There's, and anyone who's tried to repeat the same thing have been branded every other name, but governments have been reactively running around doing this, doing that, when you've actually got the head giving a very balanced speech. And I think it's a bit the same with the banks. I mean, the banks aren't stupid. They know what's going on. They know where this is heading. Um, they, they'll happily keep printing money for governments if they want it because it'll make more money for them. It'll make more interest for them. And governments, I think, will happily keep printing money because their citizens scream for it. Now, some governments will make some attempt to improve things. But yeah, look, that's a long answer to saying. I think they're their interests are very much tied overall. But in saying that, if anything, I think the banks are more balanced than the government about the whole thing. Jerome Powell has made the choice where he chooses to give people pain in order to save the dollar. Warren, what do you think will come first? Too much Powell pain where people pressure politicians who in turn pressure Powell or Powell getting down to his roughly mythical 2% target rate? Yeah, well, look, when you keep printing money, it's very difficult to avoid inflation. It's like a spiral effect, because when you study the history of inflation and economics was always a subject that fascinated me. It happens because let's just say I'm selling you stuff in my business. And then I notice the price is going up for everything everywhere around me. And I go, hang on a sec, my money is not getting me what I used to get myself. So whereas before, let's say my I make up a figure here, my thousand dollars for the week, would get me this, this, and this. Now it only gets me this, this, and this. I go, well, I would up my prices, so I plunk them up. And then someone else who uses my services notices I plunk my services, my, I put my prices up. So we go, oh, I better put my prices up. So that's what causes inflation. It's just a pure supply and demand thing, and people stop trusting in the currency being stable. And so, I, I how on earth they're going to keep it to get it to two percent? It's hard to really see that possible without some very major correction of some kind. So yes, it's possible we could get there, but it's gonna take a very major correction of some kind of, I'm talking about probably 70, 80% on the market or something like that. Now, that's my, my view. That's the only thing that could possibly get that kind of stuff because once you get that spiral going on, it's just gonna keep going up. In saying that, it's been weird the last 20 years. I would have thought we would have seen things 
kind of blow, blow up before this, and yet somehow we've kept going, and we just somehow have found a way to do it. So this could go on for quite a while longer, for all I know. It's just that America pretty much is living on a debt-based economy, on a permanent debt. Um, all governments in the Western world are doing that by and large now. Many of the Asian countries and some others are not doing much so much. To me, I can't see anything less for the next 10 years, a shift in the balance of power, fairly major economic collapse of some kind. And um, yeah, like inflation spiraling out of control at some stage, I really do. I mean, whether it will go as bad as it got in, say, Venezuela or some other countries, time will tell. But I certainly think, I, I certainly have heard already, speaking to people in the US, I mean, crazy things like 30% jump in this thing and then 40% in six months and then 30 percent in this and suddenly fuel has just doubled and things like that and i was in thailand speaking to a girl from russia you know who i started seeing and um yeah she was buying stuff in thailand with me and she said oh yeah these are doubled in the last three months i said doubled she said yeah the prices have doubled so everyone i'm speaking to is noticing a, a soaring of prices even australia which is more stable my chiropractor who i went to has increased his price twice in the last six months and i'm like wow Whereas for four years, he hardly increased it. And then, and then someone else did dip around me, and they're all saying the same thing. Look, rent costs have shot up, this price has shot up. It's a whole demographic issue. Like, for example, in Australia, in Subiaco, in, which is a, a suburb where we live, a very posh suburb, there is many, many vacant properties. And the reason why is not why people think. Yes, COVID was definitely a factor. But another big reason is many of it is people over in, um, you know, foreign countries like Japan and, um, you know, Singapore and um, India and various other stuff, very wealthy people who purchase properties, buy them for cash and just leave them, put a high rent, don't understand the market. And when they can't, when they ask for rent reduction, refuse to give it and then stay, stay focused on their rent. So you've actually seen that kind of stuff going on. So all around, and honestly, it's a bit of a mess. It, I'm, it's hard to really see anything other than some a lot of bankruptcies, a lot of economic um, adjustments happening in the next couple of years. The only thing that might mitigate stock market crashes is governments keep printing money that will keep it going up. But there's going to be a point when the population, like every time in history, 100% go, no, no, no. We don't trust this currency. We're going to go and find alternatives. And that's when pew, it'll happen. That's my feeling. If you're enjoying this interview with Warren Black and I, please consider subscribing to our YouTube channel and let the algos know you'd like to see more content like this. And if you'd like to learn more about systemic wealth protection, please do visit us at www.silverbullion.com.sg. You think there's a chance that central banks may actually lose control somewhere along the road? Oh, very much so. I think that the world's in a very, very interesting place. I'm watching with fascination and just watching the trust in government at all time lows. You know, I mean, people always whinge about governments, but the level of trust in government, I, I'm i really meeting a person, even people who are very pro-government, who trust government anymore. Even like my own family, who always been very trusting government, they still do, but they have reservations now. And the trust in government is incredible. I mean, I, I was hearing stories like from you know, when I was in Thailand with this girl in Russia about the fake vaccine economy over there. Like she said, oh, yeah, she said, like, most people are just simply turn up, pay some money and they get stamped. It's just like normal over there. And when people don't trust their government to that extent, and when people don't take law seriously, you do have a problem because, I mean, I do believe that law and is good and a stable government is important for a stable society. You know, having laws that people acknowledge and honour and follow is really, really important. And... When laws get really bad, citizens start questioning them. And when they keep getting bad, they stop following them. And we're in a very alarming stage for me where people are no longer taking law seriously. So, yeah, it, to me, that's a problem. And that's I don't, and I think that's going to spill over with people refusing with taxes. I think with central banks, the trust in banks is dropping. Um, even like in Russia, I'm finding out a lot of the transfers happen now by Bitcoin because of the sanctions. Um, it's... They've been, so more and more digital wallets, which use Bitcoin and other currencies, is taking off. Um, I, I see it a bit like um, Patrick, like Uber. For example, Uber came and took the taxi industry head on. And even though technically it was illegal for Uber to do that, they just did it anyway. Um, and eventually now taxis have become a little bit more archaic, you know. And of course, live streaming when it first came out and, and online music, 
I don't know if you remember that time, but they absolutely pummeled Napster. They took them to court. But while they were taking Napster to court to try and stop them, all the record companies, more sprang up and eventually they gave up when they joined them. I just see the same thing. I think that that the more they try and stop it, the more it'll spring up and eventually they'll, they'll just buy into them. And I think you'll find digital currencies will take off. Central banks will kind of become less relevant, but they'll still have their hand in there by being smart enough to invest in some of these other things. That's my feeling. But I definitely see the role of the central bank as we know it ending um, at the level of power. There's a book called The Sovereign Individual by Reeves, Moggs and Davidson that predicted that the nationalisation, the big national state would break down. And I see it happening now. And we'd move into smaller sovereign communities, people relying more on each other. Yeah, so that's definitely where we're heading. The timing of it, it's hard to, it's hard to say. Any time for the next two to ten years is how I see it. Okay, so with this, um, let's say, central bank failure, government failure, um, a little bit of a loss of control here, how do you envision, let's say, the aftermath of, of a world that no longer trusts governments or, or central banks? What are they going to then use for a type of a currency, a type of a, a money? Because life needs to go on. Transactions still need to be made. Yeah. Oh, look, I think there's many scenarios that could play out. I think that there is one extreme scenario of a worldwide currency being done, exactly like what happened with the COVID vaccine. You know, that was what astonished me about that was how just about every major country got involved. That that just blew my mind. I, I, I was just watching in absolute amazement how almost no matter whether it's Asian countries, whether it's South American countries, Australian, everyone seemed to get this uniform of free. And what I previously thought was maybe a bit, mm, now I'm like, wow. You could just imagine a big worldwide collapse, the World Economic Forum and various other groups getting together. We have to come up with this, coming up with some digital currency, saying we no longer accept Bitcoin, no longer accept this. So that's definitely one scenario, just some kind of major world currency, which is agreed. There's a big debt forgiveness um, where, look, we're just going to kind of give you a fresh start, do what they used to do in the ancient Hebrew times, the Jubilee, where they just simply wipe the debt out and start again. We're just going to let you, all your student loans are forgiven, and the masses go, yay, you know, just like the French Revolution. Like, oh my gosh, my credit card debt, my financial irresponsibility, it's all behind me now. And then, of course, the wealthy go, well, hang on a sec, um, they just got paid because my wealth just got reduced. Yeah, stiff vickies. You know, I can definitely see that kind of scenario happening, and that's really, in layman's terms, a great reset, where basically everything just kind of gets reset. Um, those who were financially kind of got themselves in the debt, get, get let off. Those who who built wealth on it are forced to basically um, accept a big hit to their wealth. And, 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 and yeah, that's one. Of, another one is that different countries will respond in their own different ways or in blocks. That's probably the more likely scenario in my view, even though I think the first one's a real possibility. I think that even if there are a lot of countries who adopt it, I think some countries will say, well, hang on a sec, this is too extreme. And some will create, have their own version of the Great Reset. So I do think you'll see lots of resets happening across the world. Um, I think you'll find some blocks will go one way, some blocks will go another way. Some blocks might just go off and build their own little sovereign kingdom. That's, that's more what I see likely to happen. But I think the very, very universal outcome will be digital currency of some form. You know, like Australia might have a digital dollar. US might have a digital dollar. There may even be an agreement that the Western blocs say, yep, yeah, we will accept it as, you know, any US dollars will accept for Australian and vice versa. And then, then Asian countries might say, well, we're going to do this version of it or whatever else. I mean, I find it very hard to believe that there'll just be one currency that every country in the world will take. But then again, the vaccine basically did that kind of stuff. So that said, I think people's health's a bigger fear for them. So I think the more likely outcome is, yeah, I think you'll find that there will be some kind of universal reset happening, but there will be different countries responding in their own different way. So Australia, I'll be walking up with my phone. It'll have digital currency. It'll be government sanctioned. Anything else is not. Um, and so I'd have to use it in a different context. And then jump, jump, jump. Um, and then when I go overseas, it probably have to either convert it on an online wallet, like a jump, jump. There's like 0.1% commission that goes Australia to US. Um, and then that's, that's where I see it going. Okay, interesting. And you know, Warren, um, would an unbacked digital dollar or an unbacked central bank digital currency be a good choice for people? I mean, would people even understand that 
the reason or part of the reason why we got in this mess in the first place was because they they didn't back the currency. And so if they came in with an unbacked digital currency, would people accept it? I, I watched an astonishment, Patrick, at what went on the last three years. I mean, some of the stuff that went on was so insanely irrational, we both know, and yet the masses were accepting them. And throughout history, as I told someone, let's just go back in time. I mean, 500 years ago, women who were herbalists were being executed as witches because of a, of a, of a mob rule. I mean, people were basically being burned, burned on stakes and set on fire because they had a different view to their religion. You had um, two, about 150 years ago, you had people because of their colour forced in to be slaves in America. You know, you had... 60 years ago, people whose houses were being burnt down for their colour or being shot in theatres like Martin Luther King because they believed that whites and blacks were equal. I mean, then you've got 55 years ago, people were being forced in Australia and US to go to war and people were saying, yes, you should go to fight something that they had no interest in that was because some other country didn't like certain people. So I don't really think we've learnt a lot. So it seems to me you've got this kind of 20% which... A little bit more aware of what's going on and then there's a smaller group within that you got this kind of what i call 40 percent middle group but a kind of there but vacillate depending on the mood and ultimately their family interests and that will do it and then you got about 40 percent that are just pure fear-based mob rule you know you really do and so 30 to 40 percent and so generally for any real change you have to get that middle 40 percent over the line in what you're doing so if the middle 40% of Australia or US or whatever else got really educated on the economic system and pushed back, but that changed everything. Then I think people will say, no, we don't accept this anymore. And that is feasibly possible. But I have a feeling it'll take a fair degree of pain and get to that point because the majority of people want someone else to solve their problem. So I'm not optimistic. I'd like to be, but I'm not optimistic. I think that I do think eventually that the forces of change will bring in some kind of currency. I think you'll find that there will be a larger number of people go for a stable back wealth, but it's always going to be people who look up to people better than them with money and kind of want to be guided by them by some kind of digital currency. They don't really care if I own it or not. They just want to be looked after. So, yeah, I don't think human nature changes a lot, really. I think we evolve a little bit, but by and large, we seem to follow pretty similar patterns from what I'm observed. Yeah, I think the um, the entities that have been evolving are, are government and uh, corporations. They're seeing what they can do and what they can't do. And uh, part of this was uh, the PayPal announcement that they then retracted, of course, where spreading misinformation will get your account frozen or fined. Uh, an example of the, the world we are moving into. This is an example of the world we're moving into, especially with CBDCs or cashless, coinless monetary system coming our way. But what do you think about now corporations, even we saw with the truckers in Canada and banks, uh, your accounts being frozen because you weren't on one side of, of the line? But this is the whole kind of insanity, isn't it? I mean, 500 years ago, because people said, well, why can't women be herbalists? Oh, no, you are a supporter of witches. You are just as bad as them. Or someone says, but why can't people have a different religious view? Okay, you're a heretic. You are now going to prison and you go through an inquisition. And so it's the same kind of thing again. And then I remember 30 years ago, like 40 years ago, I knew people who used to actually go out every Friday night to beat up homosexuals. And I'd be like, why would you do that? And they'd say, oh, no, it's fun. I'm like, why would you go and do that just because they've got a different preference? And they, that actually was happening. And then, like you said, 60 years ago, people were getting their houses burnt down because of their skin colour. And then 50 years ago... They were getting beaten up just because of their skin colour. So, and now, in a way, I just see the reverse happening yet again. Now, of course, oh no, because your view is different to us, this will happen to you. And so, yeah, it's not a good place for society when you're in that kind of stuff because, yeah, to me it's simple. I grew up in a family where I was taught to accept different viewpoints, strongly disagree. Like my father and I have strong disagreements on stuff to the point where we actually start insulting each other. Then we finish and burst out laughing. And I say, okay, let's get a drink. And of course, people who don't know us are sitting there thinking, oh my gosh, this is going south. Whereas my father and I are just being ourselves. And so to me, a healthy society allows a healthy debate and things like that. And when that doesn't happen, yeah, you just literally have a breakdown of social order, a breakdown of trust, a breakdown of everything. Like people are almost scared to build wealth right now in case it's taken off them. 
you've got the situation like in Canada where people were being frozen. And that's why many of them I know are going to your company because they, they wanted to get up and protest against the fact that they're being locked down. And that's my brother who's a doctor in South Australia and I talked about. Australia, you could be a construction worker or you could be an online business like me, but if you're a cafe owner trying to feed your family, pay your mortgage, do the civic thing, oh no, you can't open your business, you have to sit there. Well, who's gonna pay for my expenses? Oh, no one, we'll work it out in, in the future. And then expected to sit there and be quiet and put up with it, you know? This was the kind of stuff that was going on. And I think economically, yeah, look, I think that freezing bank accounts because you've got different views and cancel culture, it's very much accepted by, by the bulk of the mainstream. And the biggest reason for that is what I call the intellectuals. You know, the intellectuals who've done all the study but don't live in the real world like you and I, so they sit there and they go, oh, yeah, and their lifestyle that is dependent upon going on with the agenda. Because let's just say you're a doctor or let's just say that you're a mortgage broker or let's just say you're a, a professor. Your income depends upon you supporting the system and paying your family. So if you actually question what they're doing, you wake up and find that you're, you've been fired from your job because someone put something on social media quoting you what you said at the party. Or you wake up and find that because 20 years ago you dressed up in a, as a different skin color, you're now racist and therefore you've now been fired. Or you turn up and get things like that. So people become terrified and almost paranoid and then they'll do whatever they're, whatever they're told and, they will, and, then, and, that's, and people get away with appalling cancel culture like cancelling people for ridiculous things. I mean, I've seen people getting um, literally cancelled and losing business contracts just because they suggested that during COVID that maybe you should also look at other solutions and healthy supplements as well to go along with the vaccine and, got, and literally got lost contracts. And then you have people who, because they make some kind of comment questioning the fact that, you know, about, yeah, about different genders and about can we have an intelligent discussion on this next minute? Oh, no, you're transphobic. So it then gets people to clam up. People lose trust. They start hoarding money. There's all kinds of problems that start coming out of it. And that's what I'm seeing. It weren't. How important is it for people to understand alternative asset classes that can function as a currency? I mean, considering everything that's going on, uh, function as a currency or even a store of wealth and something people can believe in and trust. Oh, I cannot. I just wish I could use words to express how important it is right now, but it can't give justice for it. Like the Global Wealth Club, it's like we teach people to build their own balanced portfolio and do that because, yeah, I mean, the people who got through COVID unscathed with good health for the people who, who were sovereign with their health, you know, they were willing to listen to government, not be completely dismissive. Like I wasn't completely dismissive of what, of what was being said, but I was doing my own health research. You know, I do my own stuff. I, I recently, for example, had a really bad, bad infection unexpectedly of my bladder. Now, so my, my health approach management was I went on a parasite cleanse. I got myself checked with my homeopath and naturopath. But I also was seeing my doctor getting an antibiotics all ready to go. And if there's any sign that an infection was growing, I was going to smash myself with antibiotics. As it turned out, I didn't need to do it because I got, on, I got onto it early and I dealt with it responsibly. And that's, and that's what's going to get you through, because if you kind of go along in the masses and hope it'll all work out and hope the world will go back to what it was before, it won't. You know, you've got to realise the world is no longer the same since COVID and it's a different world right now. And, and becoming sovereign with your finances and becoming independent of government and being what's called a captain of your own financial ship. So you know about different asset classes, you're doing it and then having good mentors to guide you, like I do with my health. Like, yes, I know a lot about health. I say, you know, and it's gonna sound arrogant, but I'll say it, I know more about health than most doctors I know because I study it, because I've had horrendous illnesses. I've had four incurable illnesses supporting the doctors that were tremendously painful, but I cured myself because I studied medicine and taught myself. And, but I still use doctors and health practitioners because I appreciate, but that's their lane, and they're gonna have wisdom all the time to guide me. So what I'm saying is that, the best way for people to move forward if they're going to get through what's the next five, three to five years ahead, this great reset, or even the next year, is in, is investing in different asset classes by getting in, educated about it and making sure you've got the right mentors and guides to guide you, and when necessary, a financial planner on more specific things so they don't completely dismiss things like retirement plans and managed funds. I mean, they've got their place. But if you rely on that, you're going to be in a lot of trouble if there's a big thing. 
I mean, sure, I might be wrong. I mean, who knows? Maybe the world will magically stay together for 50 years. I think that the odds are very much against that right now. But let's assume, so let's assume that the, the balance of probabilities suggest a major reset or collapse. If you're relying on the system, you're screwed. And so by, by so at the very least, keep some wealth in the system. I mean, I still do, but make sure you've got wealth outside the system. And when I say that, by having alternative asset classes, having gold and silver onshore in your country, offshore overseas, having private equity investments, and having good wealth mentors and educators to guide you, just like all the world's best wealthy people and sports stars always have mentors and educators to guide them, and usually have multiple ones. So oh, I just wish I could say that strongly and kind of imprint it in everyone's subconscious that everyone who listens to this take action, that's how strongly I feel about it, because I have the slightest doubt that people that don't empower themselves with their finances are going to be in a world of trouble in the same way as people who didn't empower themselves in their health during COVID and now in a world of trouble health-wise. Yeah, you, you mentioned gold and silver here. And um, I mean, we, we get this all the time where, you know, people wonder with everything going on, why aren't we seeing gold and silver getting much love as far as the price action? Well, it's a good question. Um, I would love to sit here and give you the, the absolute answer to the whole thing. I mean, logically, it should be shooting up. But again, I think that the fact that there's still this belief and hope that governments will keep printing money. I mean, people say it's artificially manipulated. Look, I like to always take the simple answer as my approach. The simpler, the better. So, and in saying that, there's always complicating factors. So yeah, there's probably gonna be complicating factors like, you know, manipulation of markets and all this. But honestly, I think if I had to guess one thing, it is still a lot of people may not believe in the monetary system, but they hope it's gonna keep working because they don't know any other alternative and people like stability. People keep eating at McDonald's, even though they know it's not great for them because it's stable. They keep going to the same hairdresser because they've got security. They stay in the marriage that they're not happy with because they've got security. They keep going to the same cafe, you know, because they're, we're creatures of habit. So people, although they know there's a problem, deep down they don't want the system to win. They want to keep going. They want to keep spending money in the current things and they want to stay secure and don't want their life to be upended. I think it's that simple. And that's what's keeping silver. I think once people realize that, that it's not going to be like that, oh, I think I think it'll just go. <laughs> okay. And you, you also mentioned something else uh, pretty interesting where you had said that uh, you should keep some gold and silver onshore and offshore. Yes. How, how important is a jurisdiction going to be for those looking to diversify the location of their assets offshore? And, and what should people look for in a safe, favorable jurisdiction? Oh, um, gosh. Um, good question. Basically, yeah, look, a good jurisdiction is a somewhere, there's so many factors that you've got to go through, and that could take about 10 minutes alone. But in simple terms, reason I like your company in Singapore, Singapore is a very stable jurisdiction. I know that. Its government is pretty good like that. But I'm able to physically see the gold, you know, the clients have all gone and seen it, all that kind of stuff. Generally, you want a, gov a, a country with government that's reasonably stable, not too prone to upheavals and things like that. And the truth is, it's a bit like new car models. It does keep changing. That's the reality as well. So you've always got to keep your, your thing on the pulse. Um, again, very important that I have the simple rule of own nothing, control everything. So in other words, you really want to make sure your wealth is held in good corporate structures or off, off foundations. Like even, even in your home country, like for example, you can set up foundations in your home country. One of the fastest growing structures in Australia right now is foundations um, among the wealthy in Australia. So not just going offshore, so as well as having offshore structures for wealth protection. So I was taught in the invisible world by Lance Spicer, you wanna have your onshore and offshore nest egg. So for me, you pick a good structure, get some good advice at the time, and look for some relatively stable company countries. I mean, Singapore to me, generally is pretty good um hong kong has been pretty good although obviously right now some are concerned with the china situation um you've got you know what i also do is i usually have a mixture of countries like that and been a, been a, a country been a structure outside your own country like in the us or uk if i'm in australia if in the us might even be in australia because using outside your own country even in a stable jurisdiction can work really really well so it's not that unfortunately isn't a simple answer you just got to kind of get advice, get the right guidance at the time. And 
yeah, just make sure your structure's onshore and offshore and don't own stuff in your own name. All right, Warren Black, before we wrap up, can you let the people know how they can follow you and, and get more insights as to how you see things panning out? Sure. Um, basically, um, www.globalwealthclub.com. So, yeah, look, basically, yeah, www.globalwealthclub.com, globalwealthclubsorry.com. And if you go on there, you'll see we've got lots of free education. Like one of my visions of that one is to me, I always ask my team, um, how much does it cost you to use Google? And they said nothing. How much does it cost you to use Facebook? Nothing. Yet they're the biggest companies in the world. Why? Because they set up something that can help everyone. And then for those who want to use it more specifically, they've got to pay a lot of money to them. So that's been the basis of the Global Wealth Club model. But I want to have one of the, my vision is the best free financial education in the world, eventually, where anyone can come on and learn the basics, just like in Khan Academy, which had a vision for free education for kids. Um, and then for those who really want mentoring or guidance or more advanced, they pay good money to work with us. So joining the Global Wealth Club as a free member, there's no strings attached. You won't get spammed with emails. You won't get hammered. We're not going to hard sell you. It's that simple because we give a lot of free education because we know that if we have a huge reach of people that number one i'm feeling good because i'm helping people get financially educated to mitigate the effect of the worldwide recession that's coming help as many people out as possible knowing that the vast majority will never actually become paid clients of us and i'm good with that because i know that those who do become paid clients um will basically get good value from us and as i tell people the universe always rewards those who who basically you know, basically serve and make a difference. All right, Global Wealth Club. Warren Black, I hope we can do this again soon. I appreciate your, your insights and your, your candidness. Some of these things uh, just aren't easy to talk about, but appreciate your honesty. My pleasure. That was Warren Black from the globalwealthclub.com. To get more insights and information on the economy, currencies, and gold and silver, please visit Warren at globalwealthclub.com. If you like this interview, please subscribe, share, and hit the bell to be notified on upcoming interviews. Audio-only versions of these interviews can be found on iTunes and Spotify.